so uh, good evening everyone thank you for joining with us today in the fourth talk of final camp of stems 2021 uh, today we have professor kavita ramanan with us uh, before we start the talk let me give you a brief introduction about her she is the associate chair of division of applied mathematics at brown university and also an associate professor uh, at brown university she is also the deputy director of institute of computational and experimental research in mathematics Her research interests vary over probability theory, stochastic processes, and their application in various other fields, starting from engineering to statistical physics and also neuroscience. Recently, she has been awarded the Guggenheim Fellowship in 2020. Today, Professor Kavita will be delivering a talk on the amazing and pretty useful topic of randomness, which we encounter every day in our life. And we just had a talk uh, some time before also talking about randomization and de-randomization. Uh, uh before we start the talk i would just request all of you to please turn on their video camera so that we can rose, uh, reach closer to a live interaction and feel free to ask questions during the talk or you can also put it in the chat box and we will take up with the professor hope you all enjoyed the talk over to you professor we hey, thank you very much i would like to really congratulate amek and anirudhan for this uh, Uh, initiative i'm uh, strongly supportive of it and it's a great pleasure to see all you um, students um, uh, interested in mathematics uh, i would like to reiterate that uh, uh, it would be nice unless you have some video problems to please put on your videos because i can actually see your faces and i can see whether you're following or not and ask and go slowly and let's make this informal i would like you as much as possible to uh, interrupt and ask questions um yeah i have no agenda to fulfill today i just want to convey some ideas um and i realize that there is a broad um range of people ranging from ninth standard to first grad undergraduate so i've done my best to try to have something for everybody and hopefully uh, everything can be followed by most of you okay um so i'm going to tell you a few tales of randomness and um uh, the general theme as we will see is um you know to show you when we think that randomness is is something that we want to get rid of often right we in fact i think what amik just seemed to have mentioned that uh, you did something about de-randomizing algorithms so people think that you want to sort of get rid of randomness but in fact you know and we think of noise is also a form of randomness if you think of brownian noise or noise and uh, of course you know noise pollution is a sort of random noise pollution that you have everywhere and you might think it's the bane of everybody's life but actually some people feel random noise is actually beneficial so actually i want to make sure that this is on a full screen mode is it yes okay now it's better um okay so you know you feel that uh many people think that um uh, i don't know how many have heard of this uh feature this this little gadget it's called a random noise generator has every has anyone let raise your hand uh, either through the you know there's a function there with that you can use raise your hand on zoom or just do it um, by showing your hand has anyone heard of a random noise generator i would imagine in india you don't need to do that oh you have okay rishvik has 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 heard about it okay so a random noise generator you know of course these are claims in uh, that have to be really verified but i just wanted to show you some articles uh in in actual journals which claim that various kinds of noise improve various things in in the brain and they, it's not just one kind of noise there's pink noise there's purple noise there's white noise and today i do not have um I I know somebody personally who actually uses a random noise generator and the idea is that when you hear background noise like maybe a siren going so let's say you're mostly it's quiet at night but you suddenly have a siren going by then that wakes you up or that disturbs your sleep but this random noise generator will sort of have this uniform noise all the time that and you will not hear the siren due to that and it sort of gives you better performance So this is what people say of course the neuroscience uh, still has to be understood so it's far from perfect but the interesting thing i saw on the internet is that you have different types of noise white noise purple noise random generators and we are not at the level where i can explain to you what white noise is 
or what purple noise is, but there's actually a a very clear mathematical definition for these different noises. Whether they actually help you, you know, improve learning, that's a different question. But it's interesting to see that people, you can actually give a very clear definition of all these things. But uh, this was just a little fun example to tell you where you might think noise or randomness is a bane, but other people think it's beneficial. But now I'm going to give you some more concrete examples where I can actually explain the math as well. Uh, where uh, you know you think of randomness as a bane, but maybe you can introduce randomness and make it beneficial. Okay, so another, the first example I'm going to give you is about dealing with long queues, which I think all of you would have uh, been quite familiar with. This is um, sort of a, a in, from Britain, but people from whether you're in a supermarket, this is in South Korea in some train station. We've all admit, uh, you know, been through this uh, buying tickets somewhere or the other. Of course, now things are a bit better, but now you have the queues that are online, right? It's not necessary that the queues have to be in, by people and online. It can be queues, your, your packets are queued on, on the internet and things like that. And so there's a huge question of how to manage long queues. Long queues are deleterious and you want to actually measure them. But what is the problem? with managing them. The problem is that you don't know how long it's going to take to service each person. You don't know how many people are going to come in to be asking for service. And so how many people do you actually uh, staff at, the, at, assuming you have a lot of resources, but you, do, you will not, you don't want to spend more than the necessary. You don't want to have idle workers. So how do you actually staff the, the system so that there are not too many queues, but there aren't too many idle workers. This is actually a completely non-trivial question. And uh, you know, a lot of people in operations research in different contexts are always working on this and trying to manage it. So when you call a call center, you don't want to be kept on hold forever, right? And they don't want to lose you as a customer. So this is also a kind of queue where you're, it's not just physical queues that we're talking about. Okay, so we of course want to convert this into a mathematical model. And so I am going to talk about the, mo the simplest mathematical model here, where you have n servers. Okay, everybody can hear me, right? Clearly? Okay, great. So you have n servers, and think of these n queues, and you have a common um, arriving stream, right? Like everybody's coming through a door, and then they have to immediately bifurcate and join one of the queues. Okay, so there's not a common queue and then you know you go to the servers, like if people have been at immigration, sometimes that's the case. You have common queues and then you have to go. Or sometimes in immigration, you actually have separate queues, right? That you have to immediately bifurcate. So this is the question where you have to immediately route to one of the queues and then you will go. And of course, as I've said, your arrival times are random. You don't know when you're going to turn up there, right? And the servers certainly don't know when you're going to turn up there. And they don't know how long it's going to take to process what your you know, particular job is. OK, so uh, what is the question? What do we want to um, manage? We want to, let's say, minimize the time spent in the system, right? So the average time spent by anybody in the system is what you want to minimize. OK, so suppose that's what you want to do. As somebody who's making a routing decision, what would you do? to do this, to, to achieve this, minimize the time spent in system? Anyone, please unmute, ask yourself. Any ideas? Make sure the queues are all like equal, roughly equal number of people. So, I mean, I don't have that ability, right? So I am somebody who's coming into the system. So I'm. how would we try to make things that are, that's very good, but I am coming in and I have to route it so how would we, how would we do, you're right, maybe we want to keep that, right? That's a very good idea, but how do we achieve that? Ma'am, maybe if, we uh, say look for the shortest queue and then keep Okay, going. that's good. And that's exactly in line with, I think, Shaurya, right? I think you answered earlier, right? Or Shrigya, and that's a yeah. way to achieve what Shaurya was saying. Uh, I apologize if I pronounce anybody's wrong, because I'm just reading your names from, <laughs> okay. So, um, so anyway, these queues without people, as I said, arise in a different thing. And if you want to minimize the average queue length over here, like people said, you might want to join the shortest queue. Now, 
if you go back to the applications I'm telling you here about, so that's really a, obviously a very, very good, not obviously, but if all the servers are sort of homogeneous, then that's a natural and a smart thing to do, as Rishvik uh, pointed out. But if you look at these systems, just look at the number of queues there are here. This is sort of like, there are like 10,000 queues when you're looking at distributed memory machines, web servers, a huge numbers of queues. Even if you have 100 queues, you know, even if you have like 25 queues, you have to count how many people there are. I have done this in the train stations, right? Like I've, I've gone and like I've made a rough estimate of how many people there are. Then uh, can you really see all the queues, right? So of course, to which queue should be arriving? Let's first see what we should do. Let's do, like I said, this is the routing question. This is what we want to know. And it was suggested we should join the shortest queue, right? So here I looked at all of these and this is the shortest queue. So I joined this. That's great. It's a very good, very good uh, algorithm. And, but it's not feasible for large N, right? For even moderate levels of N, first, what do I have to do? I have to first know all the states of all the queues. And then I have to quickly compute, which is the shortest. Okay, I mean, of course, as a human being, you think, oh, it's easy for me, to, but it's really, it's an operation where you have to sort and find the shortest of N numbers, right? So it's a computation that you have to do. And you also have to be collecting this information. And if the arrivals are coming fast enough, or there are enough queues, then there's enough sort of change in the queues that even by the time you make this computation, the queue state might have changed, right? So both from the point of view of communication, both point and the point of view of sort of computation, this is really not uh, feasible for large n. So people simply do not want to implement this. For a short system, certainly that's the best thing to do. And so even though it has great performance, that's not something you, of course, it, you assume that your average rate of coming in is less than your average service rate, right? If not, then obviously everything is gonna be unstable, right? Okay, so what might you do in alternative? Because you know, you know you can't collect all this information in time. So you might just throw up your hands and say, okay, I'm just gonna choose a queue at random. Like I'll just join something because I, I, I can't collect all this information. So I'll just join at random. So if you choose the queue at random and join that queue, so this is what we've done here. And this is of course, clearly, who oh no, would not have been a good idea if we were doing join the shortest queue, but that just happened to be the one I chose at random. And you said, can you want to think is, you know, okay. So we want to, let's compare these two. How badly will I do if I just do it random, right? Because we know that this was too expensive, but you know, how badly will I do? So. Like I said, I'm assuming service times are random, arrivals are random, but I have to be a little more precise about what do I mean by they're random. So let me tell you what I'm assuming about the randomness of the service, okay? So I have to tell you something about what's the probability of how, that it will take more than 10 seconds to process mine, right? Of, of any particular individual. We are assuming that everyone in this particular model, that everyone is coming with the same um, statistics for how long they will take to process. That is, everyone is coming with, say, say, to buy a ticket, right? So, but there might still be some randomness because how long it takes, because that person may just speak slower or the person may not be clear. They're saying, oh, should I go to the Crowley or Gurla or whatever, you know? So you're not completely clear. Okay, so here we're going to assume that the service time distribution is exponential, which all that means over here is there's, a, there's this little plot and it, if you look at this plot, and this is how it is, it tells me at any time, if I say one second, two seconds, three seconds, I just go up on the y-axis, go left, and that's the probability that I will take that much time, okay? And I'm assuming just mean one, that is the average time that I will take to go is one second. Okay, it's just a normalization, I can assume one, any number is fine, and I can normalize it to be one. Okay, so, um, so that's what I'm assuming. And here I'm just drawing if this is, um, this is one minus g of x. So sometimes it's useful to think in terms of the tails of the distribution, but it's the same. Okay, so now we're interested in what is the probability that the queues are really long, okay? So, because that's what people were really annoyed when queues are really, really long, right? And including the average, but we really not want, don't want very large queues. So as uh, you know, Shoria's suggestion 
of and uh, Rishvik's suggestion that we take uh, join the shortest queue was a really good one, as we say, because as n gets large, the probability that the, there's more than one person, that is, there's more than one person at the queue, like there's somebody who's just not being served, right? That's what it means, goes to zero as n tends to infinity. You can prove this, okay? So I'm not going to show you how to prove this. I'll be proving other things for you today, but this is something that you can prove explicitly. But for this, your Q, assuming your average arrival rate is lambda and it's something less than one, then the probability that this Q is greater is equal to lambda to the L. And now, of course, you may not have a sense of how bad that is, but I've drawn this for you. So here, the shortest Q is almost like zero here, and here there's just still a large probability that, that you could still go. And that would really not be good because just think about it, this is for one Q, and there are n queues. And so if each of them could be with some positive probability this large, you're not running a very good system. Okay? Okay, any questions so far? Is the model clear? Okay, so can now I'm looking. The, yes, please. Yes, can Pranav. Can you tell the full forms of SQ and JSQ ones? Yes, certainly. Join the shortest queue is uh, JSQ. Right, join the show. I look at all the queues and I join the one which has the least number of people or packets or jobs. Okay, so I just over here, you're looking at the ones that you join the least number of dots here, green dots, green and red dots. Okay, so this is the length of the queue is the number of these jobs, which can be people or packets or different things at different states. Okay. Okay. That's join the shortest queue. Now here, SQ1, or if you can just think it is just choosing one at random. I'm not looking even at the state of the queue. If there are N with equal likelihood, I will go to any one of the queues. So if there are N queues with probability one over N. So let's say you have an N-sided dice, you throw the N-sided dice, if it says five, I join Q5. Is that clear, SQ1? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. So SQ1, as I said, is much worse than JSQ. So now, of course, I need your help. I need you to suggest maybe something, what can we do that's better? We still have this problem. We don't want to take too much communication, but what can we do that could be better than SQ1? Um, Any suggestion? Maybe there's nothing, yes. Uh, um, uh, what if we join a queue at random, right? But um, we, meanwhile, simultaneously after each step, after each person is served, we look at our left and right, and if the queue on our, uh, on our neighboring side is shorter, we immediately transfer to that queue. And then we can reiterate this process after each step. Okay, that's actually a very good uh, algorithm. I mean, that's a very good algorithm to think of. Um, and, uh, you know, that still requires, so this here, you're, you're very much thinking about you know, sort of being in the train station yeah, and looking to the left and right. And that's yeah. very good. If you were doing that in a, um, you know, sort of in the internet and packets, then at every time you will have to keep querying your queue to the left and right. What you said is perfect because, you know, uh, when you look at this, you're, you're not doing anything. You're there and you have this information, right? So what you said is completely correct. So you have to sort of depend on which scenario, how much information is for free and how much information has to be collected. That's part of the computational thing, but it's, it's a good thing, but it's a much harder one to analyze, but I will tell you a bit more about it at the end, remind me. Okay, so, and it's also not clear that it will always be good because sometimes it will have too much communication overhead in the sort of where you can't see the other cues, right? But where you can see and you're spatially distributed, that is really a very good idea I mean, you would think, why would I not do that, right? So that's excellent. But now imagine analyzing that. That's a pretty complex dynamical system, right? You join and then others are also doing this. So maybe the queue that you thought was longer, three of them move to their next, the next queue and it suddenly becomes shorter. So it's a very dynamic process. It's a very interesting process to analyze and we will come back to that at the end. Is there any other ideas? Excellent, I'm getting great ideas. Uh, what if we, like if the number of queues is too large and what if we separate batches, manageable batches and then just, you know, for every incoming job, we put one in each batch. 
Okay, but this still requires some central manager who's 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 managing all of this, and we want to do this in a decentralized fashion. Only the person who's coming in wants to come. These are all good good uh, you know suggestions and can work. So let me tell you one. Uh, all that you said can work in different cases, and you might want to analyze it. Okay, but um, so can we do better? Like I said, so what I'm going to do is just choose two at random. Okay, so then I just have to get the information from two queues and go to the shorter of the two, right? So of course, when you joined, as Agas would say, like when you joined itself, you might have been able to see two and you would have gone to the shorter of those two, right? But here I'm assuming that sort of, I don't see any of the queues. I have to actually query each of the queues for their states. So then I choose two at random, query them, and then I go to the shorter. Obviously I would not go to the longer. And if they're the same, I can choose one at random. I mean, ties are, are not going to be important. Okay. Now, are you excited about this or not? I mean, to be honest, I mean, I, I'm thinking of this as an idea. How, how well do you think it's going to be? I mean, how much better than just at random? I mean, let's say there are 10,000 queues and I'm choosing two at any time and going to the shorter. Do you think it's going to make any a big difference or? How many think that it will really make a big difference? Or it's just going to be a small improvement on, remember, you know, we had one that was going to zero, right? Join the shortest queue. And the other one was decaying sort of exponentially, which was too slow. So what do we think? This will just decay exponentially or, you know, of course it will do better than join uh, just SLS, you know, one, right? SQ1, it'll do better than that. But will it do significantly better? It's not clear, right? And we would want to know whether it does better or not, or, or okay. So uh, we can uh, also do one thing uh, that uh, after uh, we choose one among these two queues, we can sort of remove these queue, these two queues from the list, and then apply the random number generator algorithm to, to remaining n minus two uh, queues, and then keep uh, removing two things every time. So maybe it could be better. So, so sorry, can you say that? So you want to do these two? You mean you want to do this iteratively, but then that's a lot of communication for one arrival. And remember the arrivals are very, very proportional to the number of queues, right? I mean, you would only put, a, yeah, but that's a good idea, but you know, to sort of do it sort of iteratively, but that would still be almost like computing the shortest queue, but it, you're, what you're thinking about is a sort of um, stepwise algorithm to compute the join the shortest queue, right? So if you had a, sort of, uh, uh, you could say that I could only get information about two queues at a time and you have to do it iteratively, what you said makes sense. But that's sort of the way you would find the shortest queue it, in fact, but okay, that is still too much information for a large end. Okay, so let's try to just run these simulations and see what happens. So this la random algorithm I'm calling SQ2, right? Shorter of two queues, that's why, that's the mnemonic. Okay, so that you don't. Join the shortest queue, SQ is just SQ, and then otherwise it's SQ1, SQ2. Okay, so once if I do this, then let's compare this. So remember that SQ1 is this blue line. This is the decay. What is the probability here I'm writing here? And what I've done now, instead of, it was a curve earlier, you might wonder how come it's a straight line? Because it was an exponential decay, so I took logarithms of both sides, and now we just see the log plot. Okay, log, log, plot. Clear? Okay, so we saw that it is the log of the probability we knew was linear in L. And so this thing tells me what log of lambda is. Okay, that's what theory predicts. And then this is at equilibrium. Okay, and now look at this SQ2. It's doing remarkably well because actually it turns out that theory can show us that it's gonna be lambda to the two to the L. So you get actually an exponential gain Okay, that's just completely remarkable. I really, you know, if some, I'm not sure I would have guessed that this could happen by just one extra, you know, you would think how would just getting one extra random choice amongst when there's sort of N, how will that work for us? But it does. Does anybody, so anyway, it's lambda to the two to the L. And so now you see on a log log plot, this is going even faster because it's going in an exponential scale down on a log log plot, okay? So anyway, the summary is that it does remarkably well. 
And so from an exponential decay, it becomes a doubly exponential decay of Q-length probabilities. And that's like very close to SQ. Of course, it's still not as good, but there's almost very little extra computation, right? There's, it's a huge reduction in computation. You just get two Qs instead of one, but you make this remarkable uh, thing. And this has been dubbed the power of two choices, okay? Because just with a little, and this is my thesis, right? I just introduced a little bit of random choice because, you know, the other random thing that we do, we could just have people go cyclically to Q, right? That would have the same effect. SQ1 could be implemented in a sort of deterministic fashion. But here we're doing something where we actually have to choose two at random from all the Qs. Does everybody understand I'm choosing N? There are N choose two choices at every time, but I will choose one of them equally at random with equal probability. Okay, so we might want to understand, so you might want to know how do we prove something like this, right? How would we, it's, I'm not just, okay, of course we could plot it, but that would not satisfy me at all, right? You would actually have to prove exactly what the decay is because when you plot, you might guess it is this or that, or, you know, and one simulation may work this way, one that way. That's not mathematics. So you have to actually show what is it actually doing. Okay, so everybody understands what the result is? Is it clear? That this is much, much faster by an order of magnitude than, um, than the SQ1. Okay, so again, you can plotting the various Q tail probabilities. I'm just showing you again that when it's two, it's here, and it's one, it's here, and one. So these are the original without the log. So I just wanted to show you this was the log plot, and this was this, okay. So this is a phenomenon that was discovered in the mid nineties. Um, in this context, in the queuing context, it was done by Vidinskaya, who was a woman, Dobrushin Karpalevich, 96, and also Mitzenmacher from the US uh, concurrently sort of also looked at it in 1998 and, and 2001 and made many, many applications to computer science on this. And it's been used in a variety of other contexts. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to follow what a mathematician does. So of course I could start telling you, okay, how to prove this, but this would be much more complicated. So maybe what we can try to do, all of us is come up with a simpler model, which has the same flavor and see if we can analyze that one and see whether this power of two choices is equally you know, um, applicable there. And maybe there it's easier to analyze because here we have a lot of dynamical system and, you know, I have to explain how these things are evolving, et cetera, which would be sort of out of the scope of a short thing. Okay, I will come back to this last question about, you know, do you think that this is a good model in real application? So I will come back to that at the end, but for now I'm going to make a change and talk about a different model which has the same flavor, okay? This is also to explain to you the process of a mathematician. You have this really hard, complicated problem. Then you try to choose a simpler problem to first understand whether you can understand the basic idea of the problem. And then you start adding layers. Okay, so now I'm going to choose a... Maybe I have to... Yeah, let me stop sharing and share again. Um, any questions in the meanwhile, since I'm seeing all of you now? Oh, there are lots of chat questions. Let's see, let me see what this is. Are we assuming each server has equal? Ah, yes, I did say that they're homogeneous and I'm assuming that each of them, because each job is taking exponential time. I'm assuming all the servers are alike. Of course, if one server is faster than the other, then you have to do different algorithms. And I used to follow that in the cafeteria, you know, there was a person, a server called Nadia, who was um, faster than everybody. So even if her queue was longer, I would always join that queue and then, you know, usually do quite well. But here I'm assuming everybody on average, exactly, the servers are all homogeneous. There's not one. And people actually model all these things in careful. So then let's see what else. Why did we assume the service distribution to be exponential? Very, very good question. Are you not happy, Krishit, with that, uh, with that assumption? Okay, so it turns out that that's what Do, you know, Vedenskaya, Dobrishan, Karpalevich did as well as the others. And that 
they only assume because it's easier to analyze. It is not realistic. And that is actually, you, you uh, anticipated my question as to what can you think of a more general uh, uh, formulation of this model? And uh, I will come back to that at the end. Very good question. Uh, oh, and his, because in nature, we should have normally distributed and for normally distributed. Um, so here, the service times are non-negative. So they cannot be normally distributed because the normal is symmetric and can be negative. But there are other distributions that could be, um, you know, so what is the special thing about an exponential distribution? Does anybody know? You don't have to know. I'm not assuming you know it, but does anyone know any particular property of an exponential distribution? No, I mean, the, the exponential probability distribution that fits well to random events. Like if we know it will occur randomly at any time, the probability distribution fits well with that exponential. Uh, like yes, so maybe to make it, uh, so of course, all, I mean, uh, there are different kinds of randomness. Very good. So, yes. Ma'am, it, it has a kind of lack of memory property as well. Yes, excellent. So it's it's a memoryless. It's the only con continuous distribution which has memoryless. What does that mean for those who are not already familiar? It means that suppose you've been already, uh, you know, been served for five uh, point maybe fifty seconds, then the probability that it's going to take another one minute for you to get served is exactly the same as when you first came, and the probability that it would take one minute. So the fact that you've been served for some time does not change the amount of time that you're going to take to finish this. Now that doesn't seem very realistic, right? For a service distribution. So it was a very good question, Krishna, as to why are we assuming this sort of memoryless property for service distributions? You would think that if you've been served, you know, you might say that it's not gonna take more than an hour, right? Like to, to serve my, uh, to just buy a ticket. You just, you know, in some other things. So it's really not a good assumption at all for real systems. But I will, this is exactly what a mathematician does. You don't start with the most complicated system. So you know, you should be aware where you're making simplifying assumptions. But you have to first be able to analyze and prove something. And then you have to go back and say, well, was that assumption crucial? Or can I relax that assumption? And will the results still be true? Okay. So I am going to now, even though the exponential itself is not a realistic model, I'm going to go to an even simpler model, a discrete model, which at first may not seem related, tell you how to analyze that, and then we will go back to this and I will tell you something about sort of adding more general generality here. Um, yeah, so exactly right. So any other questions? Yes, Krishit, yeah, I mean, they, well, they don't always, so, the constant processing time is, um, this is really, you have to think of the service time as the amount of job that the person comes with. So it will be random. There are different ways of modeling things. The server itself might be working at a constant rate, but the service time I'm talking about is how long it takes uh, because it depends on the size of the job as well. So you can, if you want to keep it as constant processing time, you should think of this as the size of the job. So for instance, I may have four tickets that I'm buying for me and three friends, or I might just have one ticket, or I might have a complicated, you know, I want this ticket, or I want to do a ticket exchange, and that might take more time, right? So it depends on the problem, what the job is that I'm waiting for. Okay. And that is random, and that's not a constant processing. Okay, fine. Anyway, those are model things. I do want to get to the sort of mathematical formulation. Okay, so let me share my screen again. And for that, I'm just going to do a very quick review. So before I do that, how many of you have done some basic discrete probability? Some, okay. Anyway, we'll do a quick review so that we're all on the same page, but it uh, should be. Okay, so now we're going to do some analysis. Let me go to full view. Okay. So some analysis. So of course, I'm going to say, suppose just putting us all on the same page. So now it's a, with a little bit of a digression, a little bit of basic probability, and then I'll tell you another model that is simpler than the one we started with. So consider a quantity X that can take values in some subset of the integers, say zero, one, two, three, four, five. You know, you want to think of this as sort of 
counting the number of jobs or counting of something. And for some positive integer, it could also, and so for instance, M could be one and X can take the value one if it rains tomorrow, zero otherwise, or S could be one to eight with each I representing a team playing in the IPL and X takes the value three if team three wins, right? And then so it's what probability do you think uh, different teams will win? Okay. M is the maximum number of people, for instance, can be allowed into a store like we were talking about or into a railway station and X is the number of people in the store at noon at a particular day, et cetera. So these are all sort of discrete random variables. And we have this X, please interrupt me at any time if something is not clear. And we just want to assign for each value that it can take a probability, right? Between zero and one that captures the likelihood that X takes the value K. And the only constraint on these PKs should be that they are non-negative, lie between zero and one, and they should add up to one. So I can just say they should be non-negative and add up to one, right? That automatically ensures that each of them has to be less than or equal to one. Clear? Okay, so that is called the probability distribution of X, right? We already talked about it a little bit informally in the continuous setting, but this is just very clear. This is all you need to know. It's an improbability for discrete probability. Okay, so X is just a quantity that is taking sort of different values with, so it's it's random. It's not a definite, you know, uh, a value. So it's called a random variable and the probabilities that it takes the different values uh, is given by these PKs. And the whole thing is called a probability distribution or probability mass function. Is that clear? Everyone say. Okay, so of course, if you're not familiar, you've seen histograms. The only difference is sort of, you can think of probability distributions. So this is the probability that I would take two, three, four, five. So one way to think about this quintest approach of probability is the renormalized histograms. Okay, so I'm just trying to make sure that everybody is on the same page uh, for the calculations we're going to do. I apologize to those who are very familiar with this already. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. And now I just want to remind you quickly what the expectation of a random variable with a certain probability distribution. It's just the sum of I times PI. So it's a weighted average, Right, so if all it took all the values with equal probability, so if there were m values and it took each of them with one over m, then the expectation of x would just be i pi, which would just be one over m summation i equals one to n i, and so this should be m. Sorry, then it would just be the average, right? The usual average. But here I am weighting each value by the probability that I will take that value. So that's all the expectation is, or it's also called the mean of the random variable. Okay, good, we all know that. Now, is it has how many people have seen one particular random variable that is very useful is what's called the Poisson random variable. With It's just a particular one which takes values from zero, one, two in the non-negative integers and it usually represents the number of events occurring in a fixed interval of time or space. How many of you have seen the Poisson distribution? Yes, some of you, okay. You're seeing it now, if you haven't, you don't have to have known it earlier, okay. So the probability that this value takes, you know, it's given by a very particular sum and that's a good exercise if you've not seen it before to show that this is actually summing up to one. Okay, so now that you look at this, you have X that typically represents a number of events and this is a Poisson random variable who this was actually first uh, discovered by the very multifaceted mathematician Simeon Denis Poisson, who lived from 1781 to 1840. And he originally introduced this distribution to study wrongful convictions of prisoners in a given country. And later, 1860, 20 years after his death, it was used by a physicist to study, the, to, to get an estimate on the number of stars in a particular point in the sky. Okay, so this, this is, and then it was used by, um, La, I think it is Latislaus J. Bortkiewicz 
to approximate the probability of Prussian soldiers accidentally kicked, killed by a horse kick. And you know, he did this remarkable thing. He took 200 um, Army Corps incidents and he studied how many times people died from horse kicks. So he used that as the mean, he, he multiplied this and he found the mean, so he divided the number of horse kicks by the number of different uh, incidents to get the mean. And then he said, what's the probability there were one person died, zero people died, one, two, three, four, five. And he actually had a very good agreement. I didn't put the table here because we're sort of going off topic, but that's quite amazing that he did, uh, that this Poisson thing worked. So this is just to show you that the Poisson distribution is really seems to be ubiquitous in nature. And it was also used by um, R.D. Clark to analyze um, the distribution of various other things coming up in, in real life. So the reason why the Poisson distribution is so ubiquitous is something called the law of rare events. So suppose uh, there exists a collection of N independent random variables, should be variables, each of which occurs with probability lambda over n for some positive lambda greater than zero. Okay, how many of you have seen this law of rare events? No, okay. So let's try to understand, does, maybe I would like to ask before I go on, does anybody know why the Poisson distribution is ubiquitous? So for instance, if you want to count the number of calls that are coming into a call center, let's say between now and the next 10 minutes, that is very often a Poisson distribution. Does anybody know why the Poisson distribution occurs so much in nature? Or if you count the number of droplets that fall in a little part of your roof or on the floor, if you count that, that is also Poisson. Radioactive decay is Poisson. So what is it that's making it you know, be so ubiquitous? Anyone? Okay then it's worth telling you about the law of rare events, which is very important. So suppose there exists a collection of N independent random variables, each of which occurs with probability lambda over N for some lambda greater than zero. So there are N of them and each of them is happening with a small probability. You should think of N as being large, right? And then I'm looking at the total number of events that occur. So for instance, in a call center, you want to think of N is all the possible people who could have called in. So anybody who subscribed to that call center, okay? And lambda over N is the probability that, that partic any individual will actually call in at that time, right? That's, that's gonna be pretty small for any minute, okay? So, and they're doing it independently. And if you don't know the formal definition of independent, you would just want to say that knowing whether somebody else has called or not is not going to tell you anything about the probability that I called. Okay, that's a way of thinking. About it. Okay, so it turns out if you look at Xn, which is the total number of events that occur, then the, uh, I think many of you might know that the random variable Xn follows the binomial distribution, right? So it is the same as saying that um, I choose, I'm, it's uniformly likely for me, for the XN, for any subset of callers to have been chosen. Okay, and the probability that K people would choose. So what is N choose K? N choose K is, so I have to say, what's the probability that XN is equal to K, right? That exactly K people called at some time. So that would be the probability that exactly K events happened. So out of N events, only K happened. So I have to choose which K, right? So was it, if I say three people called over here, was it Anirudhan, Rishvik, and Sohan? Was it Rohini, Sohan, and Avik? You know, lots, so which three? There are many, many choices. So I'm doing N choose K. So which would be here 35 choose three, right? And then the probability that each of those K people called in, because it's independent, it's a product, each of them is lambda over N, and it's lambda n to the k, right? And then all the others, I have to make sure they didn't call in. So I have to multiply that by one minus lambda n to the n minus k. Okay, so that's how this comes up. And you might have seen this. The fact that this adds up from k equals zero to n to one is the binomial theorem. Okay, so this is called the binomial distribution on that. 
So N lambda. What does that got to do with the Poisson? Okay, so just remember, sorry, N choose K is this, this quantity, I think many of you know, and it counts the number of combinations of K subsets that I can take from N particles. So the law of rare events or the Poisson approximation of the binomial distribution says the following. This is a somewhat complicated expression, right? It has sort of all these things to the powers and to the K. And, you know, if I have to do some uh, calculations with that, it might not be so nice. It tells me for large N, this is well approximated by the Poisson lambda distribution. And what does that mean? The Poisson lambda distribution says that I have the probability in of any random variable which has a Poisson lambda distribution of it being K is E to the minus lambda K lambda or to the k over k factorial. So it's a much simpler expression. And the remarkable thing is it says that if you have a large number of event, independent events, each having a very small probability, then the aggregate, the, the total number of events often looks Poisson. And if you'll see all the examples that I told you, including the horse kicks, they think because any one person being killed by a horse kick is a random and very, very small uh, probability event. We certainly hope it's a very, very small probability event. And so when you look, count the total number, and it's independent, right? Whether I get kicked by a horse, my horse is going to be sort of independent of whether somebody else gets kicked by another horse. And so in all of these cases, it's the same. It's the same with raindrops following, people calling, etc. You know, unless there's a sort of disaster and everybody calls in at the same time, then it will not look possible. Okay, so anyway, this is a question of modeling, but this is a law of rare events. And here's a sort of example, you can plot the binomial. This is a good thing. If you can plot things, you should just go home and plot these two things and see how close they are to each other. But here's the, the red is Poisson, the blue is the Poisson. And of course it's Poisson one, since I have to multiply the 100, which is N with the N, uh, P, then my Lambda will be uh, exactly one, right? because it's the product of these two. Because what have I said here? It's n times lambda over n is the parameter. Okay, clear? Okay, and here's just two different plots. Okay, so now uh, let's go back to our queuing problem. That was just the list, least I needed to tell you to be able to give you some idea. So I go back to my queuing problem and let's say there are m balls and n bins and I'm going to put m equals n in a minute but each ball is independently thrown into a bin chosen uniformly at random from the end bins. Okay, so we were considering earlier a very dynamic, continuous time load balancing problem. So, you know, I got scared by it. I wasn't sure how to analyze it. So I said, okay, wait, let me just do something much simpler. Let me do a simpler discrete time, you know, um, load balancing problems. So here's what I have. I have a bunch of you can think of these bins as sort of being proxies for our queues, right? And right now I'm not even thinking about the servers. I'm thinking all the servers are on vacation, okay? Which sometimes you feel when you're standing in queue that that is in fact reality. But then you have all these, 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 these balls falling into the bins, okay? So the probability that because it's uniformly at random, the J, J ball lands in bin K is just one over N. Clear? Is everybody with me? Okay, and now of course I'm interested in what is the largest number of balls in a single bin? Yeah, because I want to see what is the sort of congestion, right? There are different ways of measuring congestion. We were measuring congestion by how large queues were, but the probability of tails of queues. Now I'm just want to look at this random variable saying what is the maximum or largest number of balls in a bin, right? In any of the bins, so, okay. And what can I say about this quantity? Okay, so it turns out for, from now on, we can just set M equals N and I will just say LN instead of LMN. And I want to show, it turns out that you can show the following, that the expect, this is a random variable, right? Because depending on what choices I made or how the balls felt, uh, fell or landed in the different bins, I would obviously get a different value for LMN, right? So for each, choice of randomness that I make where I flip the coins to decide which bins for all n balls for each of those randomness I get a sort of value so it's a random value and can somebody tell me what is what is the range of values that ln can take what is the largest load 
in the system that can be? M. N. Yes, N, N, right? And what is the lowest? One. Yes, <laughs> one, okay, because we know that at least, you know, the ball must have gone. Very good. So it, this is just a random variable taking values between one and N. And I, so I can write down its expectation we did earlier. And what this says is that it is of order log N. So if you want to get an idea of how large this load is, it's going to be log N over log log N. And what does this theta here mean? It means this precisely. It means that when N is sufficiently large, the expectation, there are two constants, you know, strictly positive finite constants such that this will lie between log n over log log n. Okay, so this really tells you the or how the dip, it really captures the full dependence on n of your ln. Is this clear? So this is very much sort of a very, very simplified version of our uh, analysis of the SQ1, right? Like we're sort of choosing something at random and joining that cube. That's what this is doing. Is this clear? But of course, we're not leaving the cube, we're just joining it. And we want to see how large we get. Okay. Let's try to do the analysis and let's do some math here. So how can we show this? I'm not going to prove the whole thing, but to give you a flavor, how can we show that this is log n over log log n? Okay. So for i and k, because this is i's are the bins, k's are the balls, and they both are between one to n, you define this variable, which is going to be one. So I have an equal k here with an x, which is one if bin i contains exactly k balls. Is that clear? What this random, it's, it's, if, if you have no probability, they're called indicator functions, right, of the fact. Okay. And now, oh, I kind of, okay, what is the distribution of x i n? this x equals k for a fixed k, what, do, what would it be its distribution? Bernoulli distribution. Okay, with what parameters? And why? I'm Bernoulli because there are two outcomes, zero and one. Uh, oh. Parameters will be the probability that b and i contains exactly k balls. Right. So, so I'm thinking, okay, very good. But now I'm asking that what is the distribution of you fix a bin I and I'm asking what the number of balls that it has, what distribution would it have? You told me that it goes from oh, a okay. particular then it will bin. be some of those Bernoulli tells that is it will be a binomial distribution. Exactly. Uh, right. So, the, so no, exactly. Yeah. Very good. Tanuj. Yeah. Ex excellent. So, so we know that the number of balls in a particular uh, uh, bin is going to be the sum of certain Bernoulli random variables. And we know that the probability of the Bernoullis are one over N, right? Because each ball falls in me with probability one over N and I'm summing over N such, so it's a binomial N one over N. Okay, the number of balls, not XIN, sorry, this is wrong. Not XIN doesn't have a binomial N, but the number of balls, right? So, so don't, this is incorrect. Okay, so just, but the number of balls in a bin i has a binomial n1 over n distribution, right? So that tells me exactly what the probability of this equals to one is, which we're going to use in a minute. I'll also use this yin if bin i is greater than or equal to k balls, but we'll come to that later. So here, yin is one if bin i contains greater than or equal to k balls and zero otherwise. And so in fact, this thing is just the probability that these are ones and you've told me that this is a binomial distribution. So if it's K greater than or equal to, uh, so the probability that has greater than E to P, I only sum over J equals K to N. Is this clear to everyone? So I'm just saying, what is the probability that I have K, K plus one, blah, 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 up to N balls in that bin, clear? And this is the probability of each of them. It's just the binomial with parameter n and one over n, clear? Okay. And this is not too hard to show. I can leave it as an exercise because I don't want to do arithmetic here, but you can show that this is less than n choose k over one over n to the k, okay? The simple calculation, okay. So now, since I have n choose k is simply, I can rewrite this in this form. And each of these are obviously less than one. Each of these, there are k terms up, k terms above, 
all the terms below are greater than or equal to the ones on the top, I can ignore this and I just get one over k factorial. Okay, so I get this bound of one over k factorial here. Okay, so now I'm just going to use the short form notation, which is used often by computer science as bracket n will mean this whole set one to n. And we showed that the probability that bin i contains more than k balls was less than or equal to one over k factorial in the last slide. Is that clear? Is everybody with me on that? Okay, we showed it's less than one over k factorial. Therefore, the probability that there exists any bin containing more than k balls is the property that there exists some i such that it's true. Right now, each bin, I just, what is called a union bound. So it is the probability of each of them has one over k factorial. So the probability that either this one or that one has is going to be the sum of the two probabilities, right? And then you, keep, you simply uh, can add these and what, so the probability that there exists some i such that there is equal to is less than the sum over i equals one to n of the probability of y i n greater than or equal to k is equal to one and each of them is one over k factorial. So you have n of those terms. Okay, so you get this bound n over k factorial. And now I'm going to take k, this particular k, remember we are trying to find the maximum load, right? So I'm going to take this k to be c log n over log log n, where I've chosen c large enough such that k factorial is greater than n squared. I want this to be less than one over n, okay? So this can be done. You can check because you just have to see how k factorial grows, okay? So once you do that, then the probability that some bin contains more than k n star balls is just going to be n over k n star factorial here. But since k n star is larger than n squared, this will be less than one over n. Clear? Simple? Okay. So now, so negating this event, the probability that no bin contains more than k n stars balls is greater than one minus one over n. Yeah, I'm saying what is the probability that there is some bin that contains more than k n star balls? The negation of that event is that no bin contains more than k n star balls, right? And so it's that the probability of that is one minus the, this probability. Okay, so now I have one minus one over n. So this is what we proved, okay? And from this one can conclude that the expectation of ln, which we just write down, is less than or equal to one minus one over n or kn star minus one, a little bit of, this is simple just using this and this fact, uh, you can easily conclude the upper bound in this. Okay, is this, is this clear? Anybody have any questions here? I'm just I'm just summing over all up to k n star and then minus one and then all up, up k n star and above, and you get this. They're all bounded by n, so I have this n bound, and you can uh, you know this is a simple calculation from this. This is really the main thing. This is the main thing you should take uh, from here that the probability that no bin contains more than k n star will is very is going to one. Okay. So this is saying that my max cannot be more than Kn star on average, right? With high probability, right? With high probability means as n goes to infinity, that probability is going to one. In fact, I've said in one minus one over n. Okay, great. So that's in terms of the max load asymptotics. I just wanted to rem remind you that this was the thing, but um, it yields the upper bound in this. Okay, it didn't tell me anything about the lower bound. It just said that I can, no bin contains more than k n star balls. It doesn't say that, oh, you know, would I actually be ensured that I have k n star balls? Okay, so the rough idea of the lower bound, which I'm not going to do in detail at all, because I'm just trying to give you a flavor of what happens, is now, remember, I'm going to take this x i n, which is equals k, is one if bin i contains exactly k balls, zero otherwise. And we argued that this has a, well, not this, but the total number of balls has a binomial n one over n distribution. Now by the law of rare events, we know for large n, this is close to the distribution of a Poisson one because n times one over n is one. Yes? So if you have many, so this is a bunch of Bernoulli. I, I sort of should not have written this x i n equals k, but it's the sum of the x i n k has a Bernoulli distribution. Is that clear? Okay. So by the law of rare events, we know that the, um, 
the the that this uh, that any bin contains exactly k balls. This is close to the uh, Poisson distribution, one distribution, zi. Uh, Ma'am. And then what you do? Yes. Uh, there is a question in the chat that how did you uh, come up with the uh, bound of uh, n log log n in the first case? Like how did you uh, thought of such a bound? Yeah. So that's a very good question. Because you know, I'm sort of showing you the theorem and then plunging it in and show you. So what you do is you have this bound here. You have this. You know that this is n over kn star, right? So the first thing you show is okay, I know that kn star over factorial should I want something that is going faster uh, to infinity than n. Okay, so I that's all you know from this. First, you need, I, I can choose any Kn that's going faster to infinity than n. At that point, you don't know anything more. You do the, you only know the upper bound. So as a mathematician, you would start doing that. Then you would say, okay, now I need to get a matching lower bound. And it's only with consort with the lower bound. Then you say, okay, what estimate can I get from the lower bound? And then you make them match. Is that clear? So from this calculation, you would only have this, right? And you would not be able to take this k n star. So what I mean is you only have this over here and you can say, okay, I should choose my k n to be something such that k n factorial, when I do n over k n factorial, this should go to zero. Okay, that's all you know at that point. So any k n, such k n would be a good upper bound for the maximum. And you, you may choose it to be fast, you may choose, now you have to then come and you have to meet it with the lower bound. And that's how you, then, then when you do that calculation, you'll say, okay, this works. Is that clear? Did I answer your question? Maybe you want to see the lower bound. Of course, I'm not doing the details because it would take too much time, but does that give you an idea of how you would do it? Yes. Uh, so there is another call. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, go on. No, please, please. I like questions. Please do ask. So there's a follow-up question on that. So uh, the question is, we chose the lower bound to like uh, tighten the asymptotic bound, but was it? Uh, is there any intuitive uh, reasoning for that, like uh, without any asymptotic bound? <laughs> <laughs> that is a you mean sort of without doing any calculations, why you would expect uh, right. log log? Right. Yeah. Um, not really, <laughs> except for the law of rare events. So okay. if you know that you know that you should behave like a Poisson. So, so you see, the thing is all about mathematics is your intuition gets honed and honed. So at your level, maybe, maybe there's no real very clear intuition, but there is intuition because you know now, I have told you that binomial events behave like Poisson. So you might have actually started with the lower bound, but I was doing it sort of the simpler way for you because the lower bound, I'm not going to give you in detail. But if you were some, you know, you were first looking at this, you would say, oh, okay, I know that the number of balls in a bin are a binomial n one over n, okay? And I want to understand the maximum of each of them. So, but each of them is like a Poisson. And if I treat them and that's my lower bound. So let me sort of give you the idea behind the lower bound. So, I'm going to, so again, this, I'm sorry, but this X I N equals K, this should not be this, but it should just be the number of balls in a bin is binomial one over N for every bin, right? So if I want to find the maximum load, what would I take? Maximum over one, two, three, four, five to N of each of the, of independent binomial one or N one over N. Right. right? So then, then you're saying is I have to have an intuition of how the maximum of n independent binomial n one over n behave, okay? okay. Yeah. But we know that, but, would we, but binomial n one over n is hard with all these little calculations and discrete. So we just replace it by a Poisson willy-nilly, right? And so we have, we have a guess that if I replace it by the Poisson, then I have an explicit distribution and the extrema of IID Poissons is well known. The maximum can be computed, which of course I have not done here, but here I've just said I will replace the sort of uh, distribution of the number of bins by ZIs, independent ZIs, you have to, this is a very rough and I have been sort of hand wavy, very hand wavy here, but to give you a flavor and you've done excellent, excellent question. This is how you would actually guess first log log and over log. Then you would go and then prove the upper bound and say, oh, that's the right one. 
Is this clear? Yeah. But really the intuition is coming from the law of rare events and saying I can replace my binomials by a Poisson. And then I have to understand the maximum of a Poisson. So if you already knew all that about the Poisson, then this would be intuitive. Right. Okay, excellent yeah. questions. Thank you. Thank so you then you sure. leverage the Poisson approximation to conclude that this thing is small, which means it goes to zero as n goes to infinity, and then you get them the bounds. Okay. So this was a balanced allocation in the discrete setting, but of course it, it is not kind of, um, uh, yeah, so, so this, is just, uh, this is just the conclusion that, that we, we now do something different, right? Because we were trying to compare this with SQ2. This was the SQ1 version. Is everyone clear? I'm just choosing, uh, remember we were interested in the original queuing problem and then I converted into a balls and bins problem. And in the original queuing problem, we were saying, when is the queue large? Here, we're looking at the maximum load, okay? But we only analyzed one version where we just randomly throw at anyone. But instead, you might try the SQ2 version, which is now, instead of just randomly throwing a ball into a bin, you want to try to get lower maximum load. So again, what would you might you try to do? Of course, you could say, I'll join the shortest, but again, I don't like that because it's too much communication and too much information and state that I need. So again, I do this sort of SQ2 version, which is I choose two bins uniformly at random and throw the ball into the one that has fewer balls with tides broken at random. Clear? You see this as the analog, is this clear to everybody? Yes? Okay. And now you can ask, what is the maximum load? So you have to do a much more careful analysis here, right? Much more, more combinatorics, more comparison, because now bins are sort of becoming dependent. But this was done and by Azar Broder, Karlen and Upfal in actually a 94 paper. Uh, and with probability, some QN, which goes to one as n tends to be the most loaded bin contains only log log n over log two plus o, o, order one, some order one correction. It doesn't matter when we're talking about things of going to infinity, some constant correction doesn't matter. Is the statement of this clear? So we are analyzing the maximum load again, and now it's like log log n. What was it before? Drastic reduction from it was log n over log log n. So again, we see there's a whole order of magnitude um, gain that we get because it becomes a log log n. So the maximum load decreases significantly right, by an order of my, by a whole log, which is amazing, right? Imagine if n was 10,000 and you took log log n as opposed to just log n, you made a huge difference, right? Um, so that's again, like I said, called the dubbed of the power of two choices. So of course I don't have time in a half an hour lecture to explain all of this, right? But I wanted to give you a flavor of how you do the analysis and now those of you who have done some probability theory and maybe have more advanced or done discrete probability can try to think about how you might analyze this power of two choices, right? And, other, and then if you are stuck, you could go read this wonderful paper of Azar, Broder, Karlan, and Upfa, which would be much more accessible than the, the Q, queuing problem, which has much more uh, sophistication. Okay? Okay. Um, I, yeah, I have one more slide. So of course, this is not the full problem. If you're, this is, I'm telling you from sort of a modeling point of view, this gives me the power of two choices, but then you might say, okay, but here there was no deletions. There's nobody leaving the queue. So it's not like my original queuing problem. But so you might mod modify this discrete example and say, okay, before I throw a ball, I choose a ball at random and remove it from the system to sort of simulate services in my original queuing system. The same thing holds true with, of course, it's more complicated to analyze, but you can show a similar thing holds true. Okay, just a little bit more common. So I wanted to sort of illustrate to you this really, you start with a complicated problem that you think is compelling and it's important and it's interesting. I already made a simplification of exponential service times, but then when I made a further simplification of a discrete time, then analyze a simpler problem. And even in the simpler problem, we don't try to analyze it exactly for N. We don't say, oh, there are 10,000 people or there are 500 people. You try to say, is it going to be large or wrong? Often looking at the right asymptotics, 
Okay, and it's sort of ironic in probability when things are large, they get more complicated, but if you send the n to infinity, it becomes simpler, right? So you have these nice asymptotic uh, approximations like replacing the binomial by the Poisson. Some of you may have heard of the central limit theorem. You can also replace sums of IIDs in a different regime by the normal, things like that. Scaling limits are a very, very important point, a part of probability theory. And then you slowly add back the complications. You add back the deletions, then you add back the thing and then say, oh, can, can I understand the full system? Okay. Um, so I don't, I, I can talk to you about other instances where randomness helps, but I would rather not take more time. And I would just uh, go back to that original question for one minute and then leave it open for questions. Uh, let me share the screen again. So as I said, this power of two choices was um, you know, discovered in the mid nineties. And uh, you know, I, I was asked the question um, about whether or not, you know, why should we use exponential services by Khrushchev, I believe. So it turns out that in fact, we can go beyond exponential uh, service distribution. So there should be dist, not list. So exponential service distribution. And I wanted to say that's actually a very contemporary research. So this was done by a, a, a now a former uh, graduate student of mine, Reza Aghajani, as well as another student, Pooja Agarwal, who graduated also a little undergraduate honors thesis by Katrina Kardasakis, who did various things on these power of two choices, as well a postdoc who also did some numerics on these. And it involves the study of differential equations, partial differential equations. Um, so the, the techniques that you use to study the full queuing theorem, both in the presence of exponential and without, of course, without it's even more complicated, but even in the exponential in the 90s, uh, requires you to understand you know, calculus well, ordinary differential equations well. So uh, it's good for you to be fluent in both discrete math as well as analysis and the interplay between them is often very fruitful. So um, I, think, I think with that, I will end. I have other examples I could share, but I would rather hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. It was really, really wonderful talk. Uh, like the way you started from white noise and random noise generators and went to queue service time, which we like, which we face every day, like, like this common phenomenon. And like you showed the power of choices non-determinism and then took us to back to discrete probability distributions like poison and like and finally the interesting example of Prussian soldiers being kicked by horses <laughs> and, and the final the very important result of balls and bins and the lower bound it was really wonderful so uh, we are now open to questions and also uh, we have professor uh, B. Rao with us of CMI yeah. So, uh, Professor, uh, would you like to say something? No, this is an excellent lecture, very nice, well presented, and well motivated. Thank you, Kavita. Thank you very much. Great pleasure to see you again. Hope you're well. I should mention to actually to finish the answer to Khritish's question, actually, the interesting thing about the anal analysis when you go away from the exponential distribution is that the power of choices does not always hold. So the result that we have, and also some other people like uh, Bramson Prabhakar uh, did in a, in a particular case, was to show that if the variance, for those who know what a variance is of the service of a distribution is infinite, then there are cases when the power of two choices will not hold. So you do not get this big uh, uh, you know, uh, gain in service time, uh, in, in, in performance. That is this great double exponential decay does not happen but it does happen for all distributions with finite. So this really shows why it's important to be mathematicians and actually do the whole thing. Not say, oh, you know, I did this simple program. I'm sure it's true for everything else. No, it might not, you know? So um, yes, it, it, it's a very good question that you asked. And in fact, some real service distributions are believed to be power law. And if they do not have finite variance, then, you know, maybe you should use some other uh, randomized strategy and not this one. Sorry for that addition. I just remembered to tell you that. Yes. Any questions, please? It doesn't have to be on the talk. It could be more general. Yes, Agaz, please. Um, uh, you just um, uh, you said to remind you of that uh, looking left and right algorithm. 
the ah yes uh, thank you very much i'm glad i asked you to remind yes this is a very nice paper and this so these are so uh the kind of algorithms here where i can see everyone and i treat everyone the same those are sort of called mean field models because there's some symmetry right there's sort of a symmetry in 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 terms of how i view everybody but you could think of people uh placed on a graph you had the simple graph of of a linear graph where you just look at your left neighbor and right neighbor but it could be more complicated that you have whole neighborhood structure that is you have n people and you only connect those who are close to each other in or those who can, you can see whose cues you can see right so you can have a graph on the end and you can ask what algorithm should i use and there if you want a local algorithm this is called a local search algorithm and so this is what in fact they suggested and this has been analyzed i can send you if you send me an email i can send you the paper if you just want to glance at the abstract or more okay. so all i wanted to say is that algorithm is much more involved to analyze again it's only been analyzed in the exponential case exponential service distribution because then everything become what are called markov processes if you've heard of markov chains maybe you know that model page rank or other thing this is another kind of markov chain and for that you need this memoryless property of the distribution it simplifies the analysis so people have studied that and shown that it does quite well but you have to have some assumptions on the graph structure of course because of course if you take the extreme case of the graph structure being completely everybody's isolated it's obviously like sq1 right so but if it was that they're all connected and they have some very very reasonable properties in the graph structure then you can show that that local algorithm also can do well under some so excellent question and excellent intuition thank you uh if you have any other question you can also write to us later on and we will get it answered by professor yes it will be a pleasure for me to do that yes and uh, how many of you maybe let me get get to know some of you more how many of you are in in ninth grade no one's putting up their hands i guess uh, i can't the two see people have raised shorya galvan and pranav choudhury okay okay and how many are in at uh, undergrad first year undergraduate okay i see two hands and okay two four hands okay four hands okay agas rishvik who else uh, roshan and adishit okay very nice and what are you doing in in the first year which where from which institutions are you four of you can maybe tell me i'm just sort of curious what are your interests uh ma'am i am in um, i am in iit delhi and i'm currently taking engineering physics okay very nice yeah. excellent you learn about mean field models sooner or later for sure who the others vishvik yes yes ma'am i'm from uh, iit bhuneshwar doing computer science and engineering okay very nice uh so, rishit says that uh, he is uh, doing his uh, his second year computer science engineering at ps university bangalore okay and so i you, i'm at isa yes. mohali in my third year doing physics yeah okay okay but very nice to see this broad range i hope that those of you are from you know the 9th to 12th i know there lots so i would love to you know have been able to be there and then actually talk to all of you but maybe another time if you have any questions about probability theory statistics or anything else you know feel free to email amek and he will consolidate it and send me or 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 email me directly by looking at me on email i wish you all the best for your future math endeavors and uh, embrace the randomness in your trajectory <laughs> that's what i would say um yeah and i and i can always give you many more examples where randomness is useful so uh another another session another time we would like okay. we would love to have another session of your soon <laughs> sure. so yeah. i Does think any, just out of yeah, curiosity sure. has anybody here uh, heard here in this in this uh, group about the johnson linden strauss lemma no 
okay. No. So that would be a very interesting, that's another place where randomness is used in a very beautiful way uh, that I would be happy to share with you at some point. That would be great. Okay. So uh, thank you once again, ma'am, for this beautiful talk and thank you for accepting our invitation. It was really wonderful to have you in STEMS 2021. So uh, we all meet tomorrow in the second day of uh, STEMS 2021, where the first talk of tomorrow will be given by Professor Sujatha of uh, University of British Columbia on prime numbers. Oh, very nice. Very nice. So hope to see you all there. And thank you once again, ma'am. And thank you, Professor B.V. Rao, for joining us today also. Thank you. Very nice to meet you, Professor Rao. Honored thank to have you at the talk. Thank you, Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Professor Kavita, once again. It was an excellent session. My pleasure. All the best to all the students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.